But the thing that I hire for is someone's personality, and I'll explain. It's someone that, that I feel like I wanna be in a relationship with. How do I determine that? Years ago, someone said, hey, could you picture being on a 10-hour flight with this person next to you? And if the answer is no, that usually hits you in your gut, not in your brain. Your brain tells you, hey, this resume is awesome, let's bring this person on. Your gut tells you, if you're watching this and you're a, a, a coach, if you're watching this and you run a business of some sort, if you're watching this and you're a manager of other people, I have a couple of questions for you. Question number one, have you ever had trouble letting others do the work that you yourself are really good at? Question number two, have you ever been frustrated with someone else's productivity, ability to perform, etc. If so, then you're in the right place, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Spencer Nix. This is the Behavior and Performance Research Podcast where we talk about the art of radical health and athlete design. And in order to do that, you have to run an effective business to, to have any type of medium where you're trying to help people, any type of service, you'll quickly realize that you can't do this by yourself. So you do need other people to help. And I can't tell you how many gym owners, how many small business owners, how many entrepreneurs I've spoken to that struggle with this concept of cultivating a culture of leading a staff. And that's what we're going to get into today. The through line, if I had to give you the thesis, the thesis here is there's nothing here that uh, you would find in an Alex Hermosi reel. There's nothing that's quick. There's nothing that's um, headhunter or social media centric. This is all about a relationship. It's all about leadership. It's all about mentorship. And that, I hate to break it to you, is messy, and it takes time. But it's the best thing that I got going for me. It's the absolute highest calling that I have as far as this thing called running a business. So let's get into it. Number one, I've gone about hiring staff in lots of different ways. And there's a conventional way of doing this. And the conventionally, the world tells you that you need to have a resume. And that's, you know, any rules or heuristic, it's there for a good reason, right? You don't want to have some jackass join you that, that has no interest in this. But I can tell you that it's a huge mistake just to hire someone based on their resume, Someone can look really great on paper. Someone could have a, a, you know, for our industry, a master's degree in exercise physiology. They could have had all these courses, lots of experience. And make no mistake, take that stuff into consideration. But the thing that I hire for is someone's personality, and I'll explain. It doesn't mean that I, I, I'm just hiring these charismatic, you know, most likely to succeed people. But it's someone that, that I feel like I want to be in a relationship with. How do I determine that? Years ago, someone said, hey, could you picture being on a 10-hour flight with this person next to you? And as silly of a question as that is, at some point, I'm asking myself that question every time we bring somebody on. And if the answer is no, that usually hits you in your gut, not in your brain. Your brain tells you, hey, this resume is awesome. Let's bring this person on. Your gut tells you, I don't like the chances of being in a relationship with this person and not hating every second of it for years to come. Now, another part that I think entrepreneurs and business owners don't verbalize is, hey, if this person isn't qualified, if I'm doing exactly what you say and I'm hiring based on this future relationship that I want to have with this person, it means they don't know what they're doing. And you're absolutely right, and it's, it's, the, it's the conundrum here. In a perfect world, you'd hire somebody that had all the credentials in the world, and maybe 10 years from now, I'll come back and, and I'll say, well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to you know, not settle for someone 
that doesn't have the credentials and the right personality. You need them both. And and I think in a in theory, that's a great answer. But in practicality, there may be something that you'll have to teach that person. Chances are they're educated, but your way of doing things will be foreign to them. Your preferred method of operation, despite their credentials, will still need to be broken down. And this is where you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, how good of an educator am I? How good of a system have I created? And if you bring somebody new on and they don't thrive, and you've already predetermined that they have the personality, they have the passion, and they're a good fit, another way of saying that, hey, you've determined that this person's on the right bus and they're in the right seat, but they're not thriving, it's not their fault, it's your fault. It means you haven't created a system that makes sense outside of your head. And it could also mean that you're not very good at educating them. And so if you find that this is happening time and time again, it may be a hiring issue. It's more than likely an on-ramping issue that's your fault. Lastly, as far as hiring goes, I can't emphasize enough how lucky we are in the service industry that we can craft this wonderfully meaningful narrative around what it is that we do. I want to know that when I bring somebody on, they're not here for money, even though that's a wonderful thing. They're not here to work out, even though that's awesome. They're here because they want to be on a crusade of changing people's lives. If I don't feel that throughout my entire being, it doesn't matter if they're a nice guy. It doesn't matter if I like them. It doesn't matter if they have credentials. If they're not ready to be on a mission, if this isn't a part of a deep, deep purpose for why they're here on earth, I don't like the chances of this not going well, but going well long term, which is a good which is a good component here. You want the person in the right seat on the bus, and you want to know that they can be on that bus for a long, long time. So from hiring, there is this training process. You know, a part of this that needs acknowledgement is if they're entering into a new system, even if they're smart, even if they're capable, they're going to make mistakes. And I think getting out in front of that and making it okay to make mistakes, making it okay for them to botch a sale, making it okay for them to misstep as far as this assessment or program design or conversation, and just know that that's part of the learning process in a new environment, will make them feel safe. That's a really important aspect of creating a great team and a great culture. You want everybody to know that they can make mistakes And it doesn't mean that there aren't repercussions for those mistakes. It doesn't mean that you won't have a conversation. But it is okay to iterate and constantly be trying to tweak this thing that you're learning how to do together. Along those same lines, and this has been years in the making, I want you to know, the listener, if you're an entrepreneur or business owner of some sort, is that a a huge tenet of mine and ours as a business is over-communication. We have yearly, quarterly, weekly, and daily meetings with different staff members. We have meetings in a group. We have meetings one-on-one. We have meetings that I have one-on-one. We have meetings with different staff members one-on-one. And out of context, that seems like overkill. I can tell you that it is not. Our time together is incredibly efficient. Those daily meetings are typically three minutes or less, but they're absolutely crucial for accountability, for real-time feedback, and for people to feel like they're a part of a team. There's meetings where we're putting out fires. There's meetings where we're tactically just making things happen. There's meetings where we go off-site We sit down together as a team, we kick our heels up, we get overly caffeinated, and we work on the business instead of in the business. Now, you could say, well, why are these people that work for you technically working on the business? 
And if you decide that you're the only one that makes decisions and the only one that's involved in the creative thought process, I can tell you that you won't have these staff members for long. Everybody wants to be swept up in the, the wonderfully exciting process of creativity. And if that's where you're good, then show them how you do it. Model it. Teach them. Bring them along for the ride. Some of the best things that we do are these one-on-one meetings. And I can tell you that there's a specific job requirement that's very mathematical. There's conversations around, hey, did you get the job done? But there's lots of conversations around, hey, how you doing? One of our favorite questions to ask is, hey, what's the highlight for you this week? What's been the highlight for you personally and professionally this quarter? Hey, looking back this whole year, What's something that you're really proud of that you did? We're constantly asking those questions because I don't want it to just be about X's and O's. I want it to be about them as a person and how they're developing. As well, I put it on myself to know everything about this person. Now, as we've talked about in, well, really a couple of podcasts ago, it's different than just being buddies with somebody. In years past, I made the mistake of just treating staff members like a good friend. And to do that is to to disrespect them in a way. Because by somebody working for you, yes, there's parts that are friendly. Yes, you'll like these people. Yes, you'll even do things that are like friends. But never forsake the role of a mentor. Never forsake the role of leadership that you have been entrusted with for this person. And so in everything I do, I want to know as much about them as possible. I want to go as deep as I can with them. But it's always through the lens of how can I help this person. It has nothing to do with me. I don't care what they know about me. But interestingly enough, they'll want to ask. And you'll also enter into a deeper level of intimacy with them in your own life. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. One other thing along the training point is over the years, we decided that there needs to be a a triangulation of help for this staff member. So it can't just be me. Over the years, we've created a director of coaching, director of programming, um, an an admin position, uh, a client success manager, a sales role. And Could I do those things myself? Yeah, but it's also nice to have another person that's participating in this, to hear feedback, to hear advice from someone besides yourself. And so I think bringing other people into this leadership role and teaching them how to coach coaches is is a great learning process for you, and it will actually make your culture and your team that much stronger. And we talked about feedback a little bit, and I want to talk about that specifically because I think it's something that a lot of coaches and a lot of business owners, and I know for myself, I struggled with for a long, long time. You have a certain way of doing things. You've probably created a ton of standard operating procedures, but those words on the paper don't communicate exactly how you want things done. When you bring somebody on, tell them this exact sentence, hey, I've brought you on to do this job but I don't expect that you'll do it perfect. And if that's true, then it means that you'll need my help. You'll need my feedback. Here's what I promise that I'll do. If I see something that's wrong, I'll be very quick to let you know. And I will let you know in a way that doesn't degrade you. And it focuses on the thing that we need to do. And then make sure that you say this last sentence because it's the most important. I'll be telling you this because I have very high standards for you. And I know that with a little bit of encouragement, you can nail those. When you say that last sentence, it puts it in context. If this doesn't mean that they're a piece of shit, it means there's no way that they can know the inner workings of your brain. You want them to, and so you'll let them know. I can't tell you how much stress that has prevented on my part. (laughs) Second, as far as feedback goes, business owners take a lot on the chin. There's a lot of stuff that we do that isn't glamorous. If you're an entrepreneur, there's a lot of stuff that you didn't really sign up for that you find yourself doing. Furthermore, when you have a staff, it's easy to to want to shield them 
from all of those things uh, because you think that it will somehow negatively impact their um, satisfaction here and their job performance. I found the opposite to be true. Every month I share our financials with the staff. Every month we know as a team what we generated in revenue and more importantly, what things cost around here. I wish I had known that in the other jobs that I had. I wish I had known what the expenses were because probably I would have understood why my boss was being such an asshole. But by sharing like, hey, the hot water heater cost $5,000 and a part of our expenses this month was replacing this piece of equipment. It's just a, it's a courtesy to them to feel in ways once again, like they're a part of this crusade, that they're not this pawn and you're the, you know, the queen moving around the board in any way you want, but they're integral pieces to this puzzle And look, you don't have to share every single thing. And and honestly, it's not necessary to go line by line on a profit and loss statement. But each month to bring them in as shareholders of this business that you're running, to know the nuts and bolts of what's happening has made hard conversations that I've had to have be in the context of why we need to have those hard conversations. And I hope that makes sense. Now, one of the things that everybody goes through. And there's a great book out there. It's called E-Myth Revisited. Is that each person that starts a business, they they typically are one of three hats. They're either great at managing people. They're great at just the, the visionary role of being an entrepreneur. But most of us fall into the role of the technician, the artist. If you're a hairdresser, you start a business, you love cutting hair. If you're a coach, And the thing that you got into this for is because you're great at coaching. And as you are successful, as you start to develop um, more and more clientele, you realize that you can't always do that all the time. And so you need to bring somebody in. But if you're really good at your craft, if you are that artist, if you're that technician, then chances are the people that you bring on aren't going to be as good as you. And that's a hard thing to reconcile. Just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's hard to see somebody do something that you know that if you stepped in because of your experience, because of your passion, because your name's on the lease, you would do a better job. And if you just bring one person in, it's a pretty demoralizing process to go through. It's like, man, this guy's not doing a great job. But realize that they're not you. And so a lot of the things that you're picking up on are stylistic differences. Two, if it's not stylistic, then you need to have a mechanism for feedback that we've already talked about so you can continually pour into them and teach them and bring them up to speed and make them better than you are at this particular thing that is your craft. Lastly, if you remember, and there's been several iterations of this, the Power Rangers, they had their individual Zords, but when they came together with the Megazord, they were more powerful than they were individually. Uh, there was a, a Transformers, like all the construction bots. I don't know exactly what they're called, Constructabots. Anyways, they came together to make this one massive Transformer. We could use a million different analogies here, but what I want to encourage you with is one person compared to you will not be as good. But if you bring a ragtag group of dirt bags together, you teach them, you've hired them based on their wildly dynamic personalities, them together will smoke you seven days of the week. So what you're seeing is a very low resolution view of what could potentially happen. You bring one person on, just be patient. You've brought five, six, seven, eight people on, and they're all killers. You're going to have a culture that's way better than you being the sole proprietor and doing this all by yourself. I can guarantee it. It's definitely been the case for myself. Now, before we wrap, this is the first time that I'll say this, but this fall we will have um, a beta group running through what we're going to call the BPR Institute. We didn't use that as our Instagram handle or our website for nothing, We feel like our mission is to take a lot of these things that I'm talking about and teach the next generation of coaches. 
In the fall, we'll have a, a group go through this in a way that we've never done before, and you don't have to live here in Dallas. Now, there's nothing right now that I can point you to, but I would definitely, definitely subscribe to all the methods that we're delivering content and keep your ears listening because in the weeks to come, in this next month, we will have only a few spots to experiment with this thing that we have taken the last 15 years to refine and to develop. And that's something that I'm very excited about. As I close, I want to remind you guys that this relationship piece, this leadership piece, it's the meta skill of business. Whatever you do, whatever your specific service is, the, the skill that, that supersedes, the skill that trumps all that is how you communicate, it's how you lead, and it's how you work through mistakes and blunders and all the messy stuff that happens in business. My father-in-law said, and I think it's true, and it's pretty funny, business would be easy if there were no customers and there were no employees, but there are. And so you got to figure out how to deal with it. And dealing with it is not a burden, it's a privilege. I'm Spencer. Thank you for listening.